Hi, everybody. I am not Andrea Salas. I know, it's a weird thing to not see our, our fantastic president. My name is Christine Schwab. I'm one of the board of directors members for FPW, and I want to welcome you today uh, for our October 90-minute spiritual oasis. And um, and if I mistakenly do something wrong, some other board member jump up and tell me. <laughs> I have no Andrea. Let me tell you. Um, we meet monthly at Park City Club on the second Tuesday to do exactly what I mentioned: a 90-minute spiritual vacation for all of us who are busy, whose schedules are hectic and insane. But we carve this time out purposefully. And I'm thinking about it as we are, in, you know, in our 26th year. I was encouraged to think about Hebrews 10:25. Let us not give up meeting together, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So for taking the time, for being here to meet with us, I really wanna thank you. FPW is committed to making sure that you continue to have this fellowship, this spiritual support for your business, for your friendships and your relationships. So. I do wanna also first say, if you're a first time visitor, we really are grateful to have you. We have a scan, a little QR code, both on the back of our uh, newsletter and on your tables. You have an opportunity to scan it and it'll collect your data. You can fill in how we can continue to communicate with you so that you hear about all of our upcoming great speakers. You have an opportunity to share your prayer request. And we take those seriously. Every board meeting we do um, confidentially pray so that your concerns, whether it's about a business decision and an upcoming contract, something personal going on in your life, a challenge, that we're lifting you up. And that's part of what we're here for. So first time visitors, in addition to that great stuff, you get a gift. What? So if you're new, you've never been with us, please raise your hand and we will come around and give you a little gift so that You've got something to read. <laughs> oh, come on. You don't have to be shy. Raise your hand. Keep them raised. And Susan Stevens of Exodus Ministries, another board member, is going to come and just give you a little something, a little love. While she's doing that, I know we're looking at this delicious pie and salad, and there is no reason to wait other than a quick prayer. So I'm standing between you and pecan pies. <laughs> Let me go ahead and as soon as the distribution is done, just to ask you to bow your head for a moment and we'll quiet ourselves and say a quick prayer. Thank you, Lord, for being a king of our provisions. And as you bless each guest, the Park Cities Club, our speaker, our businesses, our families, we trust in you to hear our prayers and answer in your timing. And as you say in 1 Corinthians 16, 13 through 14, we praise you for making us alert so we may stand firm in our faith and letting all that we do be done in love. We quiet ourselves to hear your message that will provide confirmation to us today. We know you brought us here in the midst of schedules and issues for your reason, your purpose, and we submit to you, God. Continue to lift us up and let us serve you with the gifts you've given us to the best of our ability. And let this food nourish our body and this time bless our spirits. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. While you're getting your, pe your pecan pie on, if you want to go with dessert first, um, we do have a little bit of time dedicated to what we call table talk. That is when we have an opportunity at our table, or if you're really active, go to any other table, to pass out business cards to do a two-minute little speech that gives us an insight onto who you are, why you're here with us today, all that good stuff. You should have a board member at your table that acts as a hostess that will make sure that everybody gets their fair share. And after we come back from Table Talk, we'll have a quick introduction of our speaker, Darian Kinder, about 12.25, 12.30, so that we can hear his message. One last thing I wanna encourage, I know she's stuck in the back corner, so I might do this on her behalf, is we do have sponsorship levels. Um, they range from $35 as a general member to up to uh, corporate levels of 2000. The normal spots that you find is our branch sponsor at 375 and our vine sponsor at 600. 
That means that all your lunches are covered for the whole year and the remaining amount helps us to encourage other women and other businesses to participate as well as a really cool sponsor reception that we actually have a neat one planned in November. So we'll have more details coming to those who are um, the word is going to be and I'm going to encourage you to keep your eye on your So I was thinking about yes. how to introduce somebody who I've known for seven years. And I have fun stories and embarrassing stories. And then I thought, no, I was going to try to make it relatable. We all now know in today's culture how popular influencers are, right? Then social media and fashion and TED Talks. Even in our businesses, we're always buying some book about best practices. And when I met Darren, what really struck me was the incredible influence that he had on a group of third grade crazy boys that he was preaching to. And I thought I had a handle on kids. You know, I have the mom glare, and I make this sound that's like a hissing cockroach, and it means fly down. They could care less. I was their snack lady. But Darren, when he would get up and speak, he quieted them because they really felt trust in what he was going to say. And I want to tell you that he may not be posing on Instagram or talking about his favorite new product today, but he can influence us in a whole different way and in a holy way. So he has experience serving as a secret agent, a special agent for the US Secret Service. But today I know he's gonna share his experience of 9-11 and I've heard the story and every time I hear it, I'm still touched because it changed him in such a tremendous way, in a way that really developed a fearless faith and an ability to influence others from his steadfast commitment to God. And I know that, you know, as a, as a dad of four sons, as a, um, somebody who is busy in his career, that I've been working two years to come and get him to speak. And I can't tell you how excited I am to have him with us today. So I hope that you'll equally be quieted, that you'll be moved and influenced to have restored compassion, integrity, and courage. Help me welcome Darren Fender. Thank you, Christine. Can everyone hear me? All right. Pretty good, thank you. It's glad to be, I'm really happy to be here. I know this has been has been a work in progress over the We were on schedule a couple of times, it, it seems, and I'm just glad to be here. So I'm, I'm appreciative and thankful to the fellowship of, of professional women. <coughs> uh, what you're doing here is, is great. It's it's a someone you know referred to it here as a spiritual vacation or a, a spiritual refresh, and that and that's great in your profession to take time out and to have that happen. Uh, but I'm warning you. I am gonna. I am. There will be a call to action. Let's be refreshed, and then let's go make an impact. Okay. So, um, so that's what we'll be doing. I'm gonna. I'm gonna thank uh, uh, Iram for organizing this and giving me all the information and our conversations over the last few months. And Christine, I think for that introduction. But more than anything, Christine, thank you for. I have seen over the last seven years the front row seat to your heart of service. <coughs> it, it's an honor to be here with you today. I, I'm appreciative. Um, <clears throat> Like Christine said, I'm a U.S. professionally. I'm a U.S. Secret Service agent. I have been for 22 years. Um, I'm a, a father of a father of four sons, husband to an amazing woman, amazing wife. I once uh, I was introduced to myself and I, and I misspoke and I said I'm a, I'm a father. I'm a father and husband of four. <laughs> I was at a church. It was awkward. <laughs> so I had to explain that. But no, a father of four and, and, and a husband of one. And um, but more than more than any of those things, more than any of that, I'm a sold out believer in Jesus Christ. And I'm a uh, a man with a with a message on my heart and a fire in my belly to share it. Because that's what <clears throat> part of why I was created and what I'm what I'm on this earth to do. And so today I'm gonna to, I'm gonna tell you about how all that started. I've been a believer since 16 years old, but we all have that maturation process. We all have that um, that, that sanctification process. Where, where it's, it's a long journey. And today I'm gonna to tell you a story about my experience in the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001, and the impact that that had on my life. 
um, inside, but, but what I don't want, I, I don't want, it's, it's, in crazy, it's an incredible story, it's a crazy story, but I don't want the message to get flooded out by the story. Because the message and, and the challenge, in my opinion, is far greater than the story. And I believe, I'll skip to the end here a little bit. I believe each one of you has a personal story, has a personal testimony. That is just as powerful as this story I'm about to tell. We're on that later. I can't believe it's been 20 years. <clears throat> Neither can you, I'm sure. 20 years, uh, so I, I was... I was assigned to, I was, I'm going to give, give a, a condensed version of this story because of our, our time constraints here, okay? We could be here for two hours if, I, if we wanted, but um, I was in the New York field office. I was assigned there. I was, I was a young agent, only 26 years old at the time. And um, I was in our, our, our gym. I was just finished exercising, just finished getting dressed, ready to start my work day um, when I felt a a slight rumble, right? 8.46 a.m. Eastern <clears throat> Felt a slight rumble. I was in World Trade uh, number seven. You know, there, were the seven there, was, there were seven buildings in that complex. The two towers dominated the middle. There were just four little squatty buildings on each corner of the complex. And then right across the street from the North Tower was Tower 7. It was the newest building of that, of that complex. It's the third largest building in, in, the, in the middle complex there. On the ninth floor, <clears throat> Uh, we were told to evacuate. I went out to the, uh, with all my coworkers. We evacuated down nine floors of steps, went out to the street. And I'm looking up at the street and I see I'm, I am, you know, from here to this back wall here, to the, the glass window over there, to, to the North Tower. And it is just, it had been hit from the north and coming from the north, it just, the flames were just pouring out. And I didn't know what had happened, honestly. Almost the entire day would go by. And I would not know the, the complete picture of what happened which is the reason why I made some of the questionable decisions that I made. However, uh, I knew that wasn't an accident. I knew that, and I knew I had to do something. So me and my coworkers, we, um, we just grabbed these huge first aid kits that we used for work, and we ran across the, uh, the highway there where all these ambulances were, were assembling, and we just started, we're just gonna do the next thing. That's part of my story is, uh, sometimes you just gotta do the next thing. Don't know what it is, don't know, don't know what the big picture is, what's gonna happen next. Sometimes we just have to do the next thing as brothers and sisters in Christ. Can we agree on that? Yes. Absolutely. So we're just I'm just I'm just wrapping this woman's arm that's badly burned. But I just heard this massive explosion. The second plane hit the second tower. Now I'm less than, let's talk football field. I'm less than a football field from the base of the South Tower when that happened. I'm really close, and if you remember, that second plane came in lower than the first plane. It was so low, it was so loud, but I never saw a plane, I never heard a plane. I was so focused on this woman's arm, all I know is a massive explosion now. And just debris, <clears throat> debris and rock and steel and raining, burning jet fuel was just starting to fall in everywhere. And so we all just scattered and we ran. And at that point, <clears throat> me and two other uh, co-workers, decided to enter the lobby level of the World Trade Center, the, of the, the World Towers, the World Trade Towers. Um, another, it was another guy's idea. I just followed him and said, okay, let's go. So now we're in the lobby of the towers, not really knowing what's going on, but just looking, looking to do the next thing. We found a stairwell where people were evacuating out of, and we went up the stairwell. Excuse me. We went up the stairwell about the 10th floor or so, uh, I encountered a woman who was, um, she was just physically spent. She, she could not evacuate herself anymore. Uh, she was slumped over in the corner and these people, people were just passing her by, passing her by. And it struck me and I said, no, it's not acceptable. So I, I told the other two agents that I was with, I said, you, you guys continue up, find people to help. I'm gonna help this woman. So I grabbed her, I quickly realized in about two steps, I couldn't, do, I couldn't carry her myself. And, uh, and I just grabbed a random guy as he's walking by, by the collar, literally, and said, hey, you're helping me. And we carried her down about 10 flights of, uh, flights of steps. I handed her off to some paramedics who down at the bottom of the steps. At that point, I went back up into the Trade Center, into the tower. I'm in the North Tower at this point. And um, my goal was to find my guys. My goal was to find, find, the, people, find the people that, uh, that I went in with. I got up to about the 30th floor or so. So I climbed about 30 flights of steps, or 30 floors of steps, and I uh, see that this door is open. 
to the hallway. So I go, I look down, uh, and I see uh, an image that I will never forget. I see, I look down the hallway this way, and on both sides of the, of the hallway, the walls just lined with New York City firefighters. And they were whooped. They were, they were I mean, they were, they were sweating, they were, their face, face was almost black with ash and smoke and stuff. And <clears throat> you could tell they had been in the fire. They were taking a rest, or they were regrouping, refitting, I'm not sure, but I asked them, I said, um, Hey, have you guys, has anyone seen two Secret Service agents running around? And they said yes. <laughs> I was shocked. I was like, really? Which way would they go? And they said, I don't know. I said, okay. So I had, to, I had a choice to make. I said, okay. Uh, I'm going to go back. I had no way to communicate with them, nowhere to find them. There's 110 floors there. They could be anywhere. <clears throat> so I went back down. went back down to the lobby of the Trade Center. I think of those men and women that I saw in that hallway. Knowing that more than likely, they are... They are part of the 343. 343 New York City firefighters today. Knowing that they are part of the 412. The 412 first responders, law enforcement officers, firefighters that died that day. Men and women that chose to stand in the gap and chose to, to do the next thing. So I just take that moment to honor them. I'll never forget them. But I had gone uh, back down to the lobby of the World Trade Center. And I made the, my most regrettable decision of the day. I saw a bank of pay phones. Remember those? <laughs> I speak to all kinds of groups. I talk to high school kids, they look at me. I, I tell them, you have to Google it. <laughs> Ask your parents. It's a payphone. Anyways, I um, saw a bank of pay phones. I called my wife. I called her Collect. You remember that? <laughs> Again, high school was like, what is he talking about? <laughs> I called her collect. Yes, she accepted the charges. And I had a, con a very brief conversation with her. I said, hey, I'm okay. I'm in the lobby of the Trade Center. I'm helping people, helping people evacuate, helping people get out. Um, I'm okay. I love you. She said a few words and hung up. Now, I say that's a regrettable decision because um, when I hung up, I decided to leave the tower, to walk outside to, to, to find some other coworkers, to try to find my group. But she doesn't know that. And 13 minutes later, she's out watching TV, watches the South Tower collapse. And I know it was 13 minutes because I had the phone records from the collect call. And so in that 13 minutes, she had called my parents, called my brother, called her parents, called her brother. They had called friends. And so 13 minutes later, they're all watching live TV, the tower collapse. And the last thing I had said to her was, I'm in the lobby of the World Trade Center. <clears throat> Good intentions, bad decision. <laughs> the theme of my day, really. Um, but but I wasn't in it. I was in, I was in the on the corner of Church and Vesey Street, and I'm standing there talking to a New York City uh, police officer, and I hear a, a, a strange noise, a strange high pitched metal on metal screeching sound. I turn to the police officer. I said, "What is that?" She said, "I don't know." And I look up, and just as I look up, I see the top of Tower Two buckle. And I, and, and I was 60, 70 yards from the base of that tower. Too close. And my first thought, honestly, my first thought was I'm dead. My second thought, which I believe now I know now is the Holy Spirit was right. <laughs> and I ran. And I ran, I started running across the, the intersection of Church and Bessie Street. And uh, as, I, as I'm running, I hear this, <coughs> these, those pancakings of the floors. The floor is just crushing on top of each other and each one getting faster each one getting louder and so I see a fire truck a fire truck in the intersection I said to myself self get under that truck slide under that truck for safety because the world's literally coming down on you I took a step in that direction and for reasons I didn't know then but I certainly know now I kept going straight and now I hear this freight train just coming behind me, it's that huge cloud, that debris cloud, right? And I see uh, now on Bessie Street, and I see this this truck, this like donut coffee cart type thing. I said, man, get under that, because the world's coming down on me. I took a step in that direction, and again, for whatever reason, I just kept going straight. At that moment, just large chunks of debris are falling all around me, and then the cloud takes me. <laughs> Day becomes night. Kids couldn't see my own hand in front of my face, my, my mouth, my ears, my eyes immediately filled with pulverized concrete and, and all this other stuff. 
but I'm still running because uh, there's still large chunks of everything just falling all around. It sounded like cars falling out of the sky. And I'm running and I'm running and I'm running and finally all that dissipates, all that, all that destruction, the falling objects stop. <clears throat> and I stop and I begin to walk. And I see the darnest thing. Out of the corner of my left eye, I see sunlight. I'm like, sweet. Let's go to the sunlight, right? So I, I, I stagger across the street, and I realize I'm looking up a narrow alley between two buildings. I'm looking north, and at the end of that alley is sunlight. I'm like, go. So I go, and then the Lord stopped me in my tracks. Because that blanket, uh, I've heard other survivors talk about that, that blanket suffocated all noise. Just suffocated except for screams. The screams of people in the darkness. People calling out, crying out for help. I can't see. Somebody come help me. Where am I? I'm hurt. Please help me. Somebody, those screams just uh, echoed in my brain. And it stopped me in my tracks. And I turned around and I stood in the face of that alley, in the mouth of that alley. And I started screaming at the top of my injured lungs. Follow the sound of my voice. But there's sunlight this way. Come to my voice. Follow the sound of my voice. There is sunlight. Jesus says in John 8, I am the light of the world. Those who follow me will not walk in what? Darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, that is not what I was thinking at the time. That is a metaphor. I am not equating. Let's be clear. But I was, I was standing there, and, and as I'm screaming at the top of my lungs, Follow the sound of my voice. There's, there's light this way. People started, I, I think 10, 12, maybe even 15 people made their way to me. And when they got to me, I would just shoot them up the alley. Go, go, go north. Go to, go to the sunlight. Now, I wasn't thinking it at the time. But isn't that a beautiful metaphor? Pointing people to the light of the world. Being, as the scripture said, being an ambassador of light, Right? An ambassador of light. An ambassador goes to a foreign land and speaks speaks for a higher authority, right? And that's what the scriptures say we're called to be. So I would challenge. I'm gonna give you two challenges this morning. <clears throat> Number one, I would challenge you to the, be that woman standing in the alley, pointing people to Jesus. Be that woman standing in the alley, pointing people to Jesus. Jesus says in John 10, my, my sheep hear my voice, they know me, and they follow me. And that's the call of all of us. What does that look like for you? I don't know. I, I know with the, next, with the last 20 years what it's looked like for me. But you're the only one who can answer that question. And I'll, I'll speak more to that later. And I, and I also want to point out, I cannot help but think of the condition in which those people, just let's, let's take our metaphor a step further, those people that made their way to me in that alley, what condition they were in. They were beaten, they were bloody, they were battered, they looked just like I did. Is that not the condition that we all come to Christ? Is that not the condition that we all come in, we're filthy in our, in our own sin? And then we come to him, and he takes us, he doesn't push us away, he doesn't say, go fix yourself. Go address this issue in your life. No, no. Takes us as we are. Right? And then he starts doing crazy, incredible things in our lives. Knocking down walls and all kinds of things in our heart. And it's a beautiful thing. You, each, each person in here, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, the scriptures say that you're an ambassador of light. And you have the ability to be that person standing in the alley pointing people to Jesus. So that's one. Okay, I told you, sorry, I'm going to challenge you. I'm used to talking to men. Yeah, I know my ministry is mostly towards men. You guys are a lot nicer, by the way. <laughs> and the setup's a lot nicer. <laughs> I'll continue in the story here just uh, real quickly. Um, uh, the, the, the time period for me in between the two collapses of the two towers is, is chaotic. It's crazy. I'll fast forward through it. I'll just say it was utter madness. I saw, I, I picked up a woman picked up a woman in the street and her femur was just sticking out of her leg. I put her in her shopping cart and me and another man just pushed her down the, the block to an ambulance. 
I saw a man stagger across the uh, stagger across the street and just get creamed by an ambulance that was trying to speak, you know, trying to get to the scene. I'm just utter. I also saw I also saw acts of kindness, acts of mercy, acts of grace, acts of compassion everywhere, just in that little time. But somehow, uh, I found myself on the same intersection, the same corner of the same intersection when I heard a high pitched metal on metal screeching sound. And I was like, oh no no, I know what that is. I'm not, I'm not standing around asking questions trying to figure out what that is. I started running. Right when I started running, again, here it comes. Excuse me, that pancake into those floors. And I was like, are you kidding me? This time I was running north. I'm running now, I hear that freight train coming again. Come on, I had a little bit of a head start, so I'm able to, I see a revolving door. Turns out it was the lobby of a bank. I just busted through that revolving door. I fall into the lobby as that cloud goes by. At that time, I hear somebody say, Kendler? I turn on and I look around. There's two co-workers of mine, two different co-workers. And I was, just, I mean, I felt relief. I said, like, all right, I got my guys. I got my team. We waited about 10 minutes. We organized this little search party and we went out into, into the darkness, into the, into the craziness. And um, we started bringing people back. We were looking for survivors. We weren't really finding any, but we're standing there in the, in the, in the corner of Church and Bessie Street again, and, and, and let me just describe to you, it's, it, it's, what my, uh, it's what my mental image of what hell must look like. Everything was on fire. I mean, just 200 floors of office space just collapsed, and there's paper everywhere, and the paper's on fire. Uh, ga- uh, ambulances, p- uh, police cars, all on fire. Gas tanks exploding. It was crazy. My, my, at the end of the day, my, my pants, my suit pants were like three inches shorter, because they kept catching fire. The, the, the soles of my shoes were melted and malformed because they, they kept melting. It was, just, it was just insane. And I'm standing there and the Lord put me on my knees almost literally there as I looked across the intersection at that, um, that fire truck that I was gonna get under. It was completely demolished. The wheels were turned out, it was flat. There was so much debris on top of it. Had I gotten under that fire truck, I'd be gone. <coughs> I went, I, I looked for that coffee cart, that donut cart I was gonna look for. There was so much destruction I couldn't even find. <clears throat> the Lord spoke to me really clearly. You know, Proverbs 16, nine says, uh, uh, the heart of a man plans his ways, but the Lord establishes his steps. Yes. I take that very literally. I didn't know it at the time, but he was, he was uh, saving me for something else. He's put all of us here for something else. We'll talk about that as we as we go. But I'm standing there in the middle of that intersection, and everything's on fire. And um, a friend of mine says, the guy I was working with says, we should hook up a fire hook because there's one fire truck in this entire intersection that's not destroyed. I don't know how. We should hook up a hose to that truck and put out some of these fires. And I'll be honest with you, my initial reaction was, that's stupid. We don't know what we're doing. And the other guy says, well, in high school, I was a volunteer firefighter. I could probably figure it out. I was like, you guys are kidding me. So yeah, they, they, start, boop, 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 they start doing this and that. Next thing, I'm holding the hose. Next thing I know, there's water coming out of this hose. And we just became this amateur hour, three-man firefighting team. Just, you know, putting out car fires. It, we were really bad. We got better. Um, I remember, I have a lot, it has some shame in this. I remember thinking at one time, where are, the, where are the real firefighters? Well, you know, 343 of them were gone. And it was taking so much time in that for the rest of the units from around the city to, to, to come in. So we were just doing the next thing. That's what I would challenge you to do. And just do the next thing. So we're putting out fires, and eventually, I don't know how much time passed. It seemed like an eternity. It probably wasn't. But I look around and I say, hey, guys, I think we're in the way. But if I looked up, and there were like real New York City firefighters all over the place with these huge elaborate hoses that were four times bigger than ours, and, and we're like, oh yeah, now we're just a now we're just a bother, right? So we kind of backed out. We did a, a for time wise, I'll, 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 I'll fast forward. We backed out. We did a few other little things here and there, but finally we um, we, we connected with another agent who was there. We, we connected with him. He had a car nearby. We finally found out where all the other Secret Service agents from our office had relocated, where they had. They had communication and relocated. So we all got in the car <clears throat> and we drove about 30 blocks north to Chelsea Piers. We get out, uh, they gave us a change of clothes, received some medical attention, just some bumps and bruises, some scrapes and oxygen and, and things like that, of that nature. And um, <clears throat> a certain amount of time goes by and, um, 
And when I end up, at the end of the day, about five o'clock or so, I end up on a New York City police boat, and I'm riding across the Hudson River to Hoboken, New Jersey, where I live. And it's right on, the, right on the river there on the other side, and I get there and I, I walk a few flights of stairs once I get to my apartment building, and I knock on the door because um, because I lost my keys somewhere, and my wife opens the door. I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose it. I'm gonna move on right now because I'm gonna lose it. But uh, we we embrace. She says that we fell down. I don't even remember falling down, but apparently we fell down and, and cried and and that kind of thing. And it just I I think it's worth repeating. When she opened that door, she didn't look at me and say, "You're gross. You're disgusting." I was beat up. I was bloody. My, my hair was all a mess. <laughs> That's 20 years ago. It was a long time. <laughs> um, but you know, she didn't give me the Heisman. She gave me that embrace of grace. She took me as I was, and, and that's what that's what Jesus does with us. And um, time would go by, and uh, and I would I would deal with a lot of things. But I would later launch a ministry. But I would say uh, at this point in, in this presentation here, that's my story. That's my experience. But I would turn it on you, and I'd say, what's your story? What is your testimony? Because as, as grand and crazy as that condensed story is that I just told you, that's just a story of survival. Or service, whatever. Fill in the blank. But if you're a believer, you're a professed believer in Jesus Christ, you have a salvation story. A salvation story to share. So earlier I challenged you, I said, hey, be that woman in the alley pointing people to Jesus. I'll give you an action step. Maybe that's just sharing your faith. Sharing your testimony. It could be as simple as that. There's a great, there's a great song that was out a few months ago by Elevation Worship. I just love it. It's called Testimony, right? And the, and the chorus goes like this. This is my testimony from death to life. Because grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ, I'm righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. Bam. Right there. That's the gospel. What is your story? Maybe that's how you, in your sphere of influence, in your, in, in your workplace, in your community, uh, on the ball field, uh, with, your, with your kids, with your grandkids, whatever that may be. Maybe it's just as simple as that. I guarantee you, your story of faith is far more, far more significant and impactful than my story of survival. I promise you. I'm just blending the two. And that's why the Lord saved me that day. I'm just blending the two. I'm taking my faith, I'm blending it with that story of survival, and I use it to share the gospel. Oftentimes in settings that are not like this, in settings where there's a lot of non-believers in the room. So, there's, there's your challenge. I'll give you another challenge, though. Hey, why not? We're on a roll. <laughs> I left out one part of the story on purpose. When I got back up to Chelsea Piers, me and three other agents, we walked in this big, this huge room, Ironically, about, about a room about the size of this. And we come over here from this way, if you can, if you can visualize it, and they looked like I did. We were just beaten and battered and bloody, right? And I look across the room, on the other side of the room, and I see people I knew, people I'd worked with, wearing clean suits. Perfect hair, shiny shoes, clean suits. We had a big meeting that day. We were all wearing suits. They were in clean suits. I'm, I'm looking across and I, I look at them and they look at me and I can see the I can see, I can see the look on their face. They're thinking, where have you been? <laughs> and of course, you know what was on my mind. Where have you been? <laughs> so, here's my challenge. Wouldn't it be a shame to walk the Christian walk, to talk the Christian talk? To live this life and at the end of your days because one thing I learned that day your days are numbered and we don't know the number wouldn't it be a shame to end your days in a clean suit yeah. so my challenge is get your suit dirty what does that look like fierce compassion fierce compassion 
whatever the Holy Spirit that lives within you, whatever issue, whatever trouble in the world, whatever hurt in the world, whatever uh, issue that's in the culture that really just speaks and, 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 and torments your soul, that's it. Get your suit dirty addressing that issue. Not knowing what comes next, not knowing the bigger picture, what's this all mean? I would just encourage you to do the next thing. What it's different for each and every one of you, whatever that issue is, that provokes, that mourns the Holy Spirit that lives with you. What is that? You answer that question, and then I would encourage you to go get your suit dirty. Amen. Amen. All right. I have um, I've left a little time for uh, question and answer. Okay. Um, so I don't know how much time I have. Three, four, five minutes. But You're okay. I'm, I'm welcome to answer anything. Any questions? Do you live in Dallas now? Uh, yes, we live in Dallas. We've been here for um, for for 12 years now. We live near the Dallas Richardson line. Mm -hmm. And at what point in the day did your wife find out you realized not until you got to the door? <laughs> Sorry, I really left that out. See, sometimes when, <laughs> sometimes when I condense the story, I, I leave out really important things, and people are like, "What happened to so and so?" <laughs> I was at, I was in that intersection fighting those fires, and I saw a, um, a New York City fire. No phones were working, and I looked across the street, and there's a firefighter on a cell phone, and I stalked him for like ten minutes. And the second he hung up that phone, I said, "Hey, man, can I use your phone?" I called her. Um, uh, I, I left a message on the answering machine. Remember the answer machine? Okay. Yeah. Uh, some of y'all are young in here. Y'all might know that. I don't know that. Uh, she wasn't there because she had. We lived in Hoboken, right on the Hudson River. She had walked down to the pier, the pier that sits directly across from the financial center, and she tried to. She sat there. And she said, "All I did was pray about how what I was going to do with the rest of my life." And to hear her tell the story when she gets home and she hits that little blinking button and hears my voice, you know, I'm not. I'm not even gonna try it. I'm not, it doesn't do it justice. But sorry, sorry for leaving that out. I don't really remember that I leave that part out. Shame on me. Yes. Um, how have you been affected by your PTSD? You know, I, I didn't really, um, and I think that's just that's just God's grace. Um, I, I had uh, trouble sleeping for a while, and I have I have some nightmares, but not for a long time. My biggest struggle, honestly, was uh, 2001 to about 2005. Four years of saying, "Lord, I get it. I should not be here. I should be dead twice. Um, you have my attention. I'm a I'm a good soldier. I'm listening. What are my orders? Like, what what do you want me to do with my life?" And for four years, I heard nothing. Crickets. And he, the Lord's timing is, 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 is perfect in all things, right? He just wasn't going to use me at that time. He was letting me. Well, there's a bigger story there. But um, until I was praying that prayer and, uh, sometime in 2005, and he just spoke to me. Uh, he, in that prayer, he just said, just let me use you. And I said, okay. And the cool part was I didn't even know what that meant. I said, okay. All right, I'm going to stop worrying about it. I'm going to stop asking. And then he started putting this message on my heart. He started putting um, uh, a real heart for men's ministry uh, on, my, on my heart. Started crafting a message, lead me here, lead me there. And I would eventually launch a ministry called uh, The Valiant Ministries. It's a speaking ministry. And what I do is I, I speak to groups like this and large groups and small groups and so forth. A lot of men's conferences, men's retreats and things of that nature. Because that, that's where my heart is. But this, this one particular story is, is, is great and applicable to all of us, right? But... Um, yeah, and so that's uh, so that ministry. Although I wouldn't officially launch the ministry until about two thousand eight, that ministry was was born on September eleventh. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Your two coworkers that been in with you. What, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, again, I left that out. <laughs> they they survived. Uh, they have their own incredible story. Um, the two that I got separated from at the right. very beginning. Yes, they survived. We we did. We lost one officer. We we lost, we lost a man that day, Craig Miller. Um, but those two that I was with, they, they have quite an incredible story themselves and how the rest of their experience uh, played out. But now uh, and we're still in contact to, to this day. Other questions? Spiritually, were their lives I'm sorry? Spiritually, were their lives changed like yours? Or? Uh, I do not get that sense. Um, but I... We, 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 haven't, we haven't gone there with that. You have to understand something. I didn't speak of this event for 10 years. And the Lord started to nudge me as we approached the 10-year anniversary of 
And I was like, uh, that's not accurate, Lord. You don't want, you clearly don't want me to do that. And then, you know, if he nudges you a few times, if you don't listen, he'll shove you. Right? And um, next thing I know, on the 10 year anniversary, I'm giving this testimony in front of my entire church. Before that day, Charlene, there were maybe 10 people in the world who knew that story. And now I've literally shared it with thousands. Uh, and that's a great uh, point of healing for me personally. A lot of healing came, up, came about through that, through that process. There's another well known. Um, a Christian guy who's an awesome guy, a 9-11 survivor, he quit his job the next week and was, was preaching the gospel about his experiments the next week. And we had lunch a few years ago here in Dallas, and it was, he was telling his story, I was telling my story. And God just, he uses different people for different things. For, for him, it was right then and there. For me, maybe I'm just slow. It took me 10 years. <laughs> yes? Um, I was just trying to make sure. Did you say your office was in Building 7? We, our office was in Building 7. So our entire office, the largest field office in the Secret Service was, was destroyed. Right, so you got out of there just in time. Mm-hmm. Well, that office, uh, that our building was the third building and final building to collapse that right. day. I think it collapsed about 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon, oh, okay. I think. Um, but yeah, and that caught fire just from the debris from all the other things. Yes, ma'am. So two questions. One is, uh, well, not question coming in. Are you still a Secret Service agent? Is I am. I am. Okay. And the second thing is a comment is you're in the, you're in the top. I'm in the top? Of the speakers. Oh. Oh, oh because oh, she put a lot of pressure on me. As we, were, as we were at the table, she said, you know, we've never had a bad speaker. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Well, I hope I don't screw this up. I'll take this opportunity to add my vote. Had, what about you all? Can you give Darren a round of applause? I actually, he goes, wants to let you know that we are, um, we never can give a big gift. He's done this just out of his heart, right? And out of our friendship and out of his desire to fulfill God's purpose for him of sharing this story. So he chose Finishing Well Ministries as, um, as the ministry he wanted to have his modest gift given to it is a ministry that helps for seniors to remain engaged in the skills that god has given them and in building his kingdom so thank you for awesome. speaking you. today it was a joy as thank always you. thank you darren um we have just a few things to wrap up with um as well as a closing prayer that i'm going to ask my friend susan stevens to give but I do want you to know that here in our presence, we have our next great speaker. So on November 9th, Lisa K. Gurley and Tarnisha Nickens, who's right here with us, are going to be speaking and have a unique and beautiful story to share as well that relates because it, in part, their heart and passion is within serving the military and the veterans. So if you were moved today, just keep it up. Come and see us next November 9th and continue to, um, to put on your suit and get it dirty, right? Yeah. So if you wouldn't mind, Susan, come on up, close us out in prayer. We thank you for being here today with Fellowship of Women. Shall we please? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Darren and his life mm -hmm. and his ministry mm -hmm. and his purposeful, intentional following you, his charge to each of us to do the same. And Father, I just pray for all the families that were affected that day and all the ones that picked up their pieces and each and every one of those that was touched by that tragedy, Lord, you know them, you walk with them, you've grieved with them and you are still carrying them today. And we thank you for that and we are grateful. I thank you for each and every person that's here today. I pray blessings over them as they journey out today that we would all take the charge that we've been given and get our suits dirty. In your precious name, amen. amen.